Um, what I will present today is uh, a certain way to uh, uh, articulate philosophy and uh, anthropology, not philosophical anthropology, but social anthropology. And it's something I've done all my life since I've studied in both, uh, both disciplines. It's I try to permanently to articulate these two fields. And um, we'll see if it works. Um, try to do today is a kind of genealogy of uh, violence. And um, I, even though I will take a reference, uh, Ken Malibar's uh, Violence on Civility, you lot of So my purpose is not to discuss directly the powerful analysis found in that book, but at the most to clarify them by approaching the two concepts um, in its title. Violence and civility, so different and hopefully convergent path. With respect to the question of violence, taking up and extending an indication by Hegel, Balibar proposes the concept of convertible violence and unconvertible violence. I will return to this point, especially at the end, but first address the question of convertible violence. As for the term civility, Balibar gives an, extent, an extension that seems contained the very etymology <coughs> of the term. At the same time, the way of life that characterizes the cities, civitas, civitas, and the fact of being a citizen. This notion has a Greek counterpart, politeia, more than the specifically political way of life, beyond politicals. This notion involves the idea of organization or convention as there is a constitution of a city according to Aristotle. Politeia happens to be the Greek title for, of Plato Weber. We could therefore think of the Politeia in general sense of a, a political community, a polity. In this sense, Politeia is the fact that the community exists only through the consent of all expressed by a convention, whether explicit or <coughs> most of the time. Society implicit. But are we sure that these things are as peaceful as they seem? Probably not. My question, conversion with very boss, are therefore the following. If we accept that we are constitutively a politician, can or should violence be considered an integral part of this definition? Is politics that which removes violence or that which takes responsibility for a fit for himself? And that, above all, where does this violence come from? To move forward in this approach, <coughs> I will begin with the three overtures associated with few authors central to this debate. I will, I will then attempt to propose some uh, new, uh, hopefully new, but it's all bad. So the first of the overture will be with Aristotle. We had yesterday already a discussion with uh, studies. I'm sorry, the studies were good. Oh, yes. Um, but I will return to it because I think we, might, we should do uh, an extended reading of that text by Aristotle. We know this text is the beginning of the politics, the political, where the um, man is defined as a political uh, animal. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I should stay in uh, clothes all the time. Okay, that's what we need. We must realize that from outset, that this means above all that human beings belong to a palace, that is a community ruled by laws. In the case, in, in, in this is the case in Greece for Aristotle, but not among barbarians. Based on its certainty, which is also an exclusion, Aristotle asks from what necessity does the very existence of the police proceed? And we were reminded yesterday that uh, it is this natural, uh, this natural genesis is made uh, through three steps, two natural steps, the, the family, uh, the villages, and the uh, uh, city. Each of each of each has a specific tales, which is a prediction for the problem for the family, solidarity for the village, and autarkia, self-sufficiency for the city. And the city at the end is a, is 
a true grounded being because he has this privilege of self-sufficiency. Um, that is the well-known genesis or genealogy of the city of Aristotle. Uh, through this description, there are some remarks that for me constitute a second genealogy, which is not quite the same as this articulation, family, uh, villages, city. Aristotle is aware that what he has defined is primarily the social level, <coughs> the one koinonical, uh, the standard of agreement, Politics, the political, but in the Edominian, Edominian ethics. But what does it mean uh, when you know that the human society are online those of the bees and all the animals uh, that live in groups, what, they, what makes them different? The reason for this is that humans are endowed with articulated language, laws. What is surprising is that Aristotle does not highlight the cognitive power of human life. Language is presented exclusively as an instrument of designation of the just and unjust, and thus as mean to share one's moral evaluation with others. Hence this crucial conclusion, I quote, it is the community of those moral sentiments that generate the family and the city. End of quote. Yet Aristotle does not rest here. If this shared evaluation of the just and unjust generates the community, it is because there is an ever present effect of injustice because of a specific violence in a matter of the human animal. Man, he says, quote, is the most impious and savage of animals when he lacks virtue. And quote. Continues and concludes the virtue of justice constitutes the essence of politics. The exercise of justice is the very order of taxes of the political community. End quote. Whereas the, far, the first genealogy was punctual, the second is normative and is generally neglected. The first is defined as a natural necessity to form a city. The second reveals the ethical requirement to do so. It is the more important because it involves justice which is to say, the law. What makes this shift to the ethical level necessary is the violence, a violence that threatens life in common. Without this threat, this pressure that forces humans to confront injustice, the city would not know the requirement of the law, and it would not be a specifically political community. The police, according to Aristotle, is indeed an operator or what Barimar defines as a conversion of violence into an institution. The role of this violence in the Aristotelian genesis of the city is generally ignored. We'll see that it is decisive. So I come to the second overture and I will uh, uh, compress or uh, squeeze this part. It is about uh, vapor and alignment. The concept of violence in vapor and you know, in the fairness that the state is defined as a legitimate use of violence that in the beginning of the first text, 1904, politics as a profession and vocation, or at least one sentence, we wish to understand by politics only the leadership of a political association and the of the state. And later, ultimately, one can define the modern state sociologically only in terms of the specific means peculiar to it, namely the use of physical force. And regarding an argument, you know, the, the, the criticizing of violence in the text of like society, and I just limit my, my uh, uh, reference to a few quotations. This one violence can always destroy power. Out of the barrel of a gun grows the most uh, effective comment. Common, I'm sorry, resulting in the most instant and perfect obedience. What can never grow off, out of it is power. Power is action. You can, you can, never, you can never be violent. Um, another quote by an um, It is not enough to say that power and violence are not the same. Power and violence are opposites. Where the one 
rules absolutely, the other is absent. Power um, violence appears where power is in jeopardy, but left to its own rules is aimed in the disappearance of power. So the opposition is very clear. Um, and the form of mind domination is in the private sphere of the master, the dominus, and where arbitrariness is unlimited, well, is not really unlimited, it's always tradition or some rules which are limited, but equally is not the place of equality. So I come now to the third of the with uh, Balibar commenting on Hobbes and Hegel. Violence cannot just be observed as a fact, as the goes, or excluded from the definition as uh, uh, allied as chosen <coughs> to do. Violence must be confronted. This is what Balibar proposes to do in his cross reading of Hobbes and Hegel. With respect to Hobbes, Balibar highlights the paradox most often unnoticed. The contracts that end the war of everyone against everyone by contrasting the exclusive use of force to a sovereign that remain outside of the contract constitute de facto a process that expels violence from the political realm. And I quote Balibar, but perhaps also for this very reason, politics move out of its own element to be transposed into a legal framework where true conflict ceases to exist and are replaced by rules to be enforced. And of course, we could add a standing by um, statement that is that it is as if the role of the sovereign was to focus on, him, on himself and manage the, the entirety of the violence expelled from the contracting community. He alone, the sovereign, he, she, remain in a state of nature. He feel the symbolic function of the carrier of evil in the place of other. Violence within the group is thus restricted to the interplay uh, of private passions. Violence that force individuals to get along with each other no longer has a place in the public space. Hobbes invented an efficient device to separate violence <laughs> from history. I hope I'm just your point. It can be said that Plato reverses Hobbes' approach. Balibar explains uh, the state of uh, that's, that's not the code. The state of law, H dot, is the result of an, a, a historical process through which reason is affirmed by confronting its opposite by taking upon itself its own negation. This is the half There is a speculative identity between destruction and construction. The order of the law is not a set of formal statements on which there is agreement. It is what emanates from the process itself and translates into rules and institutions the content of, of experience, the content of the experience of the spirit of a people while taking responsibility for violence, that is, giving violent action, so uh, is its unexpected result, a function that before appeared to be unconceivable. This is the rule of reason in history. But he now defines this process of conversion as follows God, a sublimation, a spiritualization, but above all, a transformation of violence into a historically productive force, an annihilation of violence as a force of, this, as a force of destruction, and their creation as energy of power of the institutions. End of quote. This means that history is made through politics, and that history is a locus, the stage of politics because it is a locus where violence is transformed into, into an institution, an institution endowed with force. So the notion of force is still remaining. And the question is, what means the force? Where did it come from? That's another, another issue. For Hegel, the complicated form of the institution is a state. And this, it takes up and expands our historical conviction that Paris is a terrorist of life and society. 
but not in the natural way. This is also why for Hegel the state cannot arise from a contract. The state is a completion of a process that is the becoming spirit of the community, and not an artifact, a legal body about which an agreement is made to conjure conflict. Is not this artifact that uh, has conceived. The state is therefore the locus by excellence of convertible violence. By contrast, this raises a radical question of an inconvertible bias. To take up Alibor's term, uh, violence, violence imperious to dialectic, and that remain outside the scheme of institutions. So, another drawing of which then a, a turning point after these three objects, and we'll try to propose a, another genealogy, uh, the Aristotelian uh, one, one or uh, what Paribas uh, well, is, is no conflict with that. It's just, it's just um, let's say, um, what the social anthropology can bring uh, in this debate, to the, in this conversation. A question arises here. It is always a state as a form, as a form that is a state in the answer given to the violence that confronts groups. It is the avenger to the state that is called open, open to a weapon of conflict. The state is supposed to prevent their recurrence, or at least their degeneration. We are thus to assume that before the advent of the state, the advent of the state, every society remained in a situation of flattened violence and could not exist as a truly political community. Our stateless society devoid of a politician. At this point, philosophy in short is short in most in resources. It must call on specialized knowledge, above all, the knowledge of social anthropology, with the simple question, what is the status of stateless society? We must assume our inquiry based upon new foundation. So <coughs> now I will uh, come to a question which is uh, I saw was spoken of the family as the first item, a form of uh, Society, and which is insufficient, but is the first form. And uh, I think that Aristotle has already accepted a, a, a modern conception of the nuclear family as a natural case for society, and which is highly debatable, especially for traditional society. So I will come to the question of exogamy alliance as, as the genesis of the true institutional order. And I will say few things that probably you know if you can read. <coughs> Stuff, or the, 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 the discourse of the test of, of Kinshi. Um, no one today can seriously claim that truly political societies begin only with the energy of the state that would amount to claiming the society without a central authority, such as intergeneral society, are by definition non political societies. Laos and thus undermined by endemic violence. I believe that we must completely reject such claims and assert that from the outset, every human society emerges as a political society, which is to say, a public order ruled by laws, whether explicit or implicit, beginning with the acts that constitute them as human societies, the exogamic alliance. Both of the two worlds are important. The most universal of the rules that mark the specificity of human society is the obligation of, for couples to form outside of each partner consanguineous groups, parents and children, brother and sister, or similar thing. This is the rule of exogamy, meaning marriage outside the group, observed in a very traditional society. It is also, it has also another name, the so prohibition of fences. I know this debate is much more complicated, but that summarizes uh, to come to the, to the point. According to a list of demonstration, now fully accepted, more specific point. This prohibition is not based on morals or even biology, although this factor may have played a part later, especially now. It mandates at the same time alliance with another group and reciprocity, since for any wife given, a wife must be given in return. It is a rule of alliance in the sense that the consumer of groups renounces close group upon itself and accept that within the group, a production of life must occur through a different groups, 
A human society is possible only as a union between us and them, the same and the other. To enter an alliance is to bring together the familiarity of our own with the strangeness of them. So the stranger is there from the beginning. Every human society begins with this gesture by which we stand away from ourselves and accept that which is not us. To enter an alliance is to overcome the separation and keep together what is different. Human society can exist only through this condition of others. And this condition goes immediately, not just by reciprocity in two relations, by implying a third party, le tiers, uh, the law, the rules, and immediately is not natural. And immediately is institutional. It makes the core of a politique. So, from that point, I will uh, develop to the next, next, uh, next concept of alliance, which is alliance made so the uh, reciprocal exchange of gift in traditional society. This is not how we now improvise it, uh, not really my text. This, this alliance or this exchange of gift is not about being just generous or not, not at all charitable. Of course, not is not a potter, is really a symbolic pact. And this pact is done through some good considered as precious because it represents the self of the guild of the group. And this this fact that this this uh, uh, given things are um, represent rep uh, are the third party in in in, uh, in the thing itself. The principle mean implies a public, a public reciprocal alliance with some proof that the alliance is made, like in the traditional um, way of being, 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 doing the contract in the old ways or from Rome uh, by bringing uh, in, in two parts uh, a pottery and each party uh, keeping half of it. To be shown in the future by adjusting the two, the two, uh, the two parts of this pottery to recognize that a pact has been made before. This is the meaning of the uh, exchange of the international society. Is this just a peaceful process, like the uh, in Aristotle, the natural uh, formation of the city? The answer is no. Is it interesting text by both at the end of uh, this essay on? Uh, this is what on the gift of the in English. Two, two traditions, uh, two translations, sorry. So I read most, speaking of traditional society and uh, an Asian society. So I quote At this time, men meet in a curious frame of mind with exaggerated fear and an equally exaggerated generosity which appears stupid in no one's eyes but our arm, our mother. Uh, readers, or what? In this primitive so and archaic society, there is no middle path. There is either complete trust or mistrust. One lays down one's arms, renounces magic, and gives everything away, from casual hospitality to one's daughter or one's property. It is in such condition that men, despite themselves, learn to renounce. What, the, what was their unmade contract to give them sorry, and reciprocate. But then, I had no choice in the matter. When two groups of men meet, they may have moved away, or in case of mistrust or defiance, they may resort to arms, or else they can come to negotiations. So this is the story of the uh, exchange. These lines clearly raise uh, from the outset the problem of violence as an initial situation that imposes this alternative between armed conflict and an alliance to a gift exchange. We must take care to not misinterpret it. It's not just generosity and goodwill. First, it's important that each will provide a grant and that the, the, the sense of the substitute and token of oneself, which is the good thing. 
So this is exactly a process of public recognition between the two groups. It is not just um, civilities, goodwill, it is public recognition, public, public acceptance. And this public recognition, um, where the uh, masculine alliance plays main roles, is really the purpose of politics. So, is therefore a pact that generates the consent of the group in Parliament. And that is why I call it a political pact. So the conflict is over there, is over the horizon of this public recognition, of this public procedure. We now better understand the concept of political sphere. It's a sphere where the members of the community grant one another public and reciprocal recognition. In society, we are a state as a world, and we must understand that is, is really crucial. In state, we are a state as a world, like our societies. This recognition is granted by law, but it remains the responsibility of groups and individuals as a social and interpersonal level. So recognition is still uh, in process in, 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 the, in the civil society, and not just granted by law. And this is, is your charming would, would be interesting. So, to, to just mention uh, again, the, the big part is struggle for recognition with the deep kind of Caucasian interpretation. And the big difference is the Italian figure of, of the conflict of the uh, master servant uh, dialectic is they are in the, in the, in the hand, they are nothing, all just arms. And the difference is the reciprocal. I know, you kill me. So, <laughs> So uh, that's the, the, the interesting and fundamental point. So now from this the situation of reciprocity, what is interesting is the possibility for the troops in the stateless society to, uh, to, to, to be in conflict uh, through an offense which must be uh, vindicated. And that is also interesting to understand that the concept of, of justice is not the the way to do justice is not what we call vengeance, is vindicatory justice, which means this process of vindication is, a, is precise as a limit, a certain procedure, I can be confused. When this doesn't work anymore, then we have the modern vengeance. It's exactly the case of we see in Aeschylus uh, Orestia, and where, where uh, the vengeance is unlimited, like what kind of big house, the traditional way of medical interest is the working. And we have the same problem with Antigone. It's not a conflict of the family and the state. It's, it's tragic because it's a conflict between two public space. The public space of, of kitchen and the public space of uh, the new city. So, having said that, um, I will come to uh, the last moment. So, a second turning point before the conclusion is this. Um, we have tried to do a kind of genealogy, so uh, with a, a contribution of social anthropology, of the public space, of the politeia, of the justice. And now, uh, well, we have the last question, which is, well, but where the violence comes from? And that is the big, the big uh, issue. I don't think that philosophy by itself, and even anthropology, can give us an interesting answer. We have to um, turn ourselves to our uh, ethology and um, to, 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 enter, to, to question our phylogenetic uh, heritage. We must go back to that research and understand uh, what is the origin of this violence? Um, the best, uh, even this uh, highly debatable, the best answer I found is in Conrad Lawrence's uh, aggression. Um, where Lawrence explained that um, all species, of course, we know that, and this is a pure Darwinian uh, uh, repetition, that all species are fighting, and this is not moral or immoral, it's just the way of life. But in the case of human society, something has happened which is absolutely uh, not 
the case of other species is that um, this violence, which or this capacity of uh, fighting, in the case of human society, has lost its goals and redirect um, itself toward other human groups or e even toward the group itself. And so this is the diversity potential is still there with new new arms, new weapons linked to the uh, technical uh, change. And this creates a totally different situation that uh, we don't not observe in other animal society. So the question uh, raised by, by uh, Lawrence is this, should we wish for a desactivation of aggressiveness itself? The cost will be huge, he says, because this aggressiveness is also part of our personal relation, is no love of friendship with this aggression. But is that the world which is really the, the appropriate world? Isn't, isn't it this force of energy that we find in the whole form of life? So having said that, and I regret that to, to squeeze my, my, uh, my development on Lawrence, but um, I'm not satisfied, and probably you are not satisfied <coughs> with Lawrence's demonstration. Um, and I will conclude with these two remarks. Okay, we'll take two minutes. First, we must accept that violence originated from the phenomenon of life itself and from the relationship among species. From this perspective, philosophers and social scientists have much to learn from ethologists. But the converse is also true. Lawrence moved almost naively from the aggressiveness observed in human to the moral prohibition that restricted, that restricted it. Though it remained prisoner of, of a view of human beings as individuals and it understands good as we are aggregates. It does not, it does not realize that, that humans are intrinsically symbolic animals. Their collective existence is from the outset an institutional existence governed by rituals, prohibition, obligation, reciprocal commitment, and relationship of recognition, which convert the violence of the species into an, an order of force and civility. These are the fundamental procedures of ceremonial gift exchange and exogamic alliance, which form the core of the politeia. The same can be said of the empty center of the Greek, uh, in the Greek palace, the famous circle of the warrior, which bring equality to the palace, and more generally, of legal system of public recognition, which is to, to say, of the various type of public institution today. Second, these institutions are not only converter of violence, and this is where I uh, join the Tien Balima approach. These institutions can also become, in their turn, those are a means of violence. This applies to states, institutions, and the legal apparatus. Any institutional system can become an instrument of domination. There is no such a thing as a nature domesticated and pacified by culture. Culture can complexify violence. It can make violence sophisticated, de devious and ter terrifying. Devious, yeah. mm -hmm. It can extend violence beyond all boundaries and turn it in into all. Such is extreme violence, Alibaba rightly called inconvertible. The uniqueness of humankind exposes human to unique violence. It is with this threat in mind that Aristotle viewed the necessity of parties at the order of justice. The city emerges among humans to resist self-destruction. But if this violence is not convertible, if no rules of reason can give it meaning because is pure nothingness, devastation, suffering, and terror, then it is nothing less than a challenge to the very existence of humankind. This is why the crime that originate from this violence are claimed in respect. This is also why the obligation to respect other human beings cannot be deduced from something else. It is inescapable beyond all institution. It is an unconditional requirement. It is also extreme 
as a danger is nothing else can nothing else than this absolute obligation can reject and prevent the most destructive violence like this violence but in an entirely different way this obligation too is inconvertible thank you Thank you so much for this, these new uh, this anthropological and ethnological perspectives on violence, um, politics, reciprocity, with a very interesting reference to the, the issue of the animal, with uh, reference to uh, ethology. Um, so I will keep my questions maybe for later, and I immediately open. Yes, that is fine. I wonder if you would say a little bit about the difference between justice and law in their relation to violence. You seem to make them uh, synonymous, uh, justice with law. It seems to me that, at least in terms of the conclusion of your talk, one could, one could make a strong distinction between how justice serves uh, to uh, conceptualize violence respond to violence and how law does. Now, justice is a process. Um, it's a nice sort of term, justice is a virtue. And um, what we call justice most of the time, and we speak of, we speak of uh, institution of justice, or the justice function, something like that. But if we speak of the justice as a process, is is a bit different. I mean, it's not just, it, it's not enough to refer to institutional justice. So it's, um, I'm not sure that you have in mind when you ask your question. Laws are this institution. Um, when when um, I, I say this reciprocal, this mandatory justice in touch with society today is ensured by law in our society, means we have this right, we know it's there, we know that uh, if there is a conflict, we are protected. We don't need to circulate with plenty of people in our pockets and be recognized. We know we are legally recognized. We have this resource, but this doesn't change. At this point, it's not sufficient. There is a, a struggle for a recognition within the institution, within the, the system, the legal system. That is legality. And, but it's not enough because we have also, we need also, and this is a new debate about recognition, we are not satisfied <coughs> with just having a legal protection or a legal status, but we need to fight for it. We need to, to, to transform this legality into a social practice. And that is, is a permanent uh, situation in which we are. So um, is, is this your point? I'm not sure. No. I was asking about um, the way in which justice, uh, the way in which the, the notion of justice figures in, in Derrida, for example, as the undeconstructible, and the way law is quite different from that. And I was wondering if that's, if that's like where you were going in some way. Oh, yes. that's, not that, that's maybe the last line of my, my talk. Uh, is uh, in the same way that there is crimes considering festivals, there are obligations which are also mandatory, whatever. Uh, and uh, that is I think that the Derrida has in mind are also living us in uh, also Alibaba in the violence and civilization is something which is beyond all institution. And, and if there is an unconvertible it must be also uh, a prescription which has no condition. And that could be, I think, the, the interesting point in uh, what's it's be beyond or under the, the second genesis I proposed to read in Aristotle text is um, violence is at the horizon of, of the, all this process of becoming a city, of having this being together, making this being together possible. And is is the permanent this permanent threat of a violence which which is there whatever whatever we do whatever the institution um, of uh, 
peaceful institution are, and that's also the obvious solution, is someone has to integrate in his figure this violence which should be expelled from the society. So, um, well, there is a kind of, uh, is there is a kind of a radicality of violence which also uh, necessitate the radicality of the answer to it. But the, the permanent question is, where does it come from? So that's why I think going to the how to drop the theme uh, philogenic philo philo uh, uh, heritage is necessary, is something which is part of human evolution, but not only. Precisely, uh, in the case of human beings, uh, we have invented in some ways a violence which elapsed in, 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 in extreme violence, as Bar says, which is not in uh, human society. And we learn a lot to confront this territory of violence. So I hope that we can discuss it see if I have not really understood your point. Okay. Um, Marcel, thank you so much. Uh, I have to admit that. Uh, my ears are, are, are bad, and you have the kind of voice that I don't hear well because it's uh, soft and, and, and uh, grave, beautifully grave. I, I can imagine you singing uh, some, uh, some uh, dry parts. And, uh, yes. and anyway, um, so I, I'm not entirely sure that I caught everything you said, but I'll tell you. Um, first um, reaction and, and, then, and, then, and then a question. Um, first reaction, uh, since you've been referring very generously to my uh, uh, exposition of the question of extreme violence and particularly the use I made uh, 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 of that uh, idea that I, of the difference between convertible and unconvertible violence, which of course is, in my opinion, is not an essential or essentialist distinction. It entirely depends on circumstances. There, uh, and it's uh, so. So uh, I, I particularly wanted to insist in some passages on the, uh, of the book on the fact that if we follow a Hegelian uh, scenario, uh, um, there's no such thing as unconvertible violence, apparently, because in the long run. The long run in which, uh, as Keynes uh, famously said, we will be all dead, and now it's the planet, maybe. Uh, um, the, uh, um, uh, um, uh, every, 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 every violence is converted one way or another. But our political problem is not in the long run, it's in the present. And, and this is where the question becomes uh, impossible to ignore. Now this being said, uh, you may be aware, I, I might say bitterly aware, but this there's no reason why to regret anything. Of the extent to which uh, the uh, um, exposition that I gave was heavily dependent, in fact, on that uh, Hegelian narrative of the construction of the state, the historical construction of the state as a process of conversion of violence and even extreme violence into law and institutions. And therefore, of course, the whole modernist uh, Pace, Gabriel, a modernist narrative uh, um, that Hegel pushes, in a sense, to its uh, 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 absolute perfection. And as a consequence, uh, the, 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 the questions I tried to raise about uh, convertible violence, extreme violence, its different forms, etc., um, uh, are biased in, in, in many respects. I mean, even if I do not adopt a statist position myself, narrative of progress, in fact, I'm continuously dependent on the fact that these unconvertible violence primarily uh, emerged as a sort of remainder, uh, as a sort of leftover, as a sort of uh, 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 res resilient or resistant uh, uh, element of uh, otherness that precisely the Hegelian narrative and other progressivist uh, modernist narratives uh, 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 doesn't uh, really uh, uh, resolve. And of course, I thought I found Hegel more interesting than others because, as I said in the, in the, in, in the text, because of the extent to which uh, uh, he uh, um, uh, uh, wants to, different from Hobbes and others, to acknowledge that there is extreme.
extreme violence in history and in, and in, in politics. So it's not just uh, pushing and brushing that aside. Now, you presented uh, an alternative scenario, uh, um, which uh, in, that, in the center of your presentation, uh, before moving to the question, where does it come from, uh, which was the Mosian scenario. Uh, and uh, 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 so, not making things too complicated. Do I understand you well? If um, I push the uh, uh, motion scenario to the, uh, uh, the following uh, uh, scheme, um, the moment in which the two groups, uh, we might want to ask, of course, where these groups come from. Uh, the anthropologists have had their own narrative, they constructed uh, where these groups come from. Uh, we also might want to, of course, uh, uh, ask uh, um, uh, to which extent uh, this could be and should be uh, transferred or applied or used to discuss issues which uh, do not only concern so-called uh, primitive societies uh, or stateless societies, but also situations or, 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 or moments I mean, of crisis, for example, in other societies with a state, but not a state that has a monopoly, a state that is, in fact, one uh, agent or participant in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the conflict. So that's generally the situation of the stasis uh, that uh, Nicolò so beautifully uh, uh, brought to, to, to the center. Anyway, at this moment, the two groups are confronted with a kind of radical alternative. Um, a moment of choice. But a choice that perhaps is, in a sense, I would borrow a Canadian uh, uh, phrase, not only indeterminate, but uh, undecidable. And nevertheless, you need to decide. And there you choose either uh, exchange, uh, a gift, uh, or you choose the other gift in the Deridian uh, 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 sense, that is the poison of uncontrollable uh, um, uh, uh, and unconvertible and, 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 and violence. Uh, so it's, uh, in this second scenario, unconvertible uh, violence is not a residue, it's not leftover. It's not something that has been suppressed somehow uh, by the institutions and that would return in an uh, embarrassing manner into a... It is something that would permanently uh, uh, form the other possibility. Yeah? And therefore, the, 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 the scenario that you want to apply is, is one in which Perhaps not all the time and everywhere, but everywhere, but periodically, uh, and in fact, regularly, we as societies or as divided societies, uh, which is what we are, uh, are in fact uh, facing that kind of uh, 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 dilemma. Uh, did I did I uh, pick up something of your uh, idea, or is it? Uh, an artificial graft on your... Uh, no, it's, it's your right in the center of the issue for me. It's, uh, but it's also because um, the question of conflict can never, is, not, is not such a thing as a peaceful society per se. It's always, it's always a, a possibility of conflict with the most peaceful one. And um, in that sense, um, yeah, um, the mo to, to me, most is, is not, is just, um, a frame, but it's the end of the essay for the is to moralis. Moralis. To what's it, uh, understanding the, this, this ceremonial exchange as a kind of benevolence and solidarity. It is not a, the problem is to make a public pact. And the, the, the Executive Alliance, which is almost in Europe all the time, is a central, uh, central uh, element of this uh, uh, public recognition among groups. Um, yeah, uh, anthropologists have their narrative, their, their mythology as well, I agree with that. 
And there are many, many uh, stories or examples which make us this uh, ideal type of uh, proposition uh, a bit uh, limited. So it's just for this short presentation that I've compacted the, the issue, but I agree with you that it's, it's, it has to be problematized more specifically within the uh, approach of traditional societies. And in which way we have changed today. And if there is a social total fact, it must not have disappeared. So what is what is this type of fact today? Or in which way has it been transformed? So that what is interesting for anthropologists uh, dealing with is the same with the question of family and kinship. We are the presentation by this morning uh, <coughs> in solidarity transformation which are now uh, in progress maybe at this point. Unfortunately we never have enough time for the debate, but the debate continues afterwards.